Today, I'm gonna try to find the best sandwich roll recipe on the internet, but not just any sandwich roll, because recently I've made it my personal mission to recreate the ultimate Philly cheesesteak at home. So this is episode two, and in the first episode, I traveled to Philly to try some of the best cheesesteaks in the city, but now it's time to work on the recipe. And I'm gonna start how any reasonable person would by trying out some recipes from the internet. I actually chose three recipes to follow, and there's a very specific reason that I chose these three. Let me show you. So when I went to Philly, I brought home two different styles of rolls to analyze. One is from Amoroso's, which is sort of the classic cheesesteak roll used at most places in Philly. It's really unlike anything I've ever had before. Super soft and chewy on the interior, but still strong enough to hold up to the weight of the steak and cheese. Before I tried these rolls, I really didn't think they would be anything special, but apparently I thought wrong. Now the store-bought version isn't nearly as good as the ones used at restaurants, but it'll still give me a decent point of reference. Now, I've also got these more rustic rolls, like the ones used at John's Roast Pork in Philly and at Angelo's Pizzeria. And these ones in particular are from a place called Karanji Baking Company, which is actually where John's Roast Pork gets their rolls from. And these are also unlike anything I've ever had before. Just looking at them, I thought they'd be like baguettes, you know, sort of rustic and chewy with a very thick crust. But that's not the case at all. On the interior, they've actually got a similar softness to the Amoroso rolls. The exterior is quite a bit darker and more crisp, but the crust is still super thin, so the rolls aren't overly hard or chewy. And these ones are also coated in sesame seeds for some extra flavor. Now, my ultimate goal is to recreate both of these styles of rolls. But if other people have already tried, then there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. Instead, I decide to start with a YouTube search. Let's see our three challengers. First, we've got Brian Lagerstrom's recipe, Brian Lagerstrom, which he mentioned in his Philly cheesesteak video, but he actually showed the recipe for it in his Italian beef sandwich video. And I chose it because it seems like the best sort of standard and rich roll recipe that I could find. So on top of the basic ingredients that all breads need, flour, water, salt, and yeast, it's also got a bit of oil and a bit of sugar. So this recipe should give me a pretty good baseline to work off of. But these next two make it a bit more interesting. Starting with Mike G's recipe from Pro Home Cooks. Mike G, which he talked about in this video right here. In his video, he actually talks about the Amoroso rolls and he claims that his get pretty close. And there's one ingredient in particular that he uses that I've never seen used before in a bread that he says helps to achieve that sort of soft store-bought effect, amylase enzyme. And actually looking at the ingredients list for Amoroso rolls, it does list enzymes on there, so he may actually be on to something here. Basically what this enzyme does is help break down the wheat into fermentable sugars so that the yeast has more food to work with. And in theory, since the wheat is being broken down quicker, the dough should end up a little bit softer with a better rise. Aside from this though, his recipe is pretty typical. He does use some milk in addition to the water though, and he also doesn't include any oil in his dough, which seems a little unusual for this style of roll, but I can't knock it till I try it. Now, the last recipe I'm using is Ethan Chabowski's hoagie roll. Chabowski. About Ethan Chabowski, which he shows us how to make in this video. But this is the most enriched dough of all these three. It uses milk entirely in place of water. It also includes oil, and it includes one more special ingredient, diastatic malt powder, which sort of has two parts to it. The first is the actual malt powder, which basically just provides flavor and helps the crust to brown a little bit better. It's sort of hard to describe, but just think of the flavor of bagels because malt is what gives them their distinctive taste. But the other part is the diastatic part, which basically just means that this contains some of that same amylase enzyme, like what Mike used in in his recipe, albeit in a pretty small amount, only about 1 50th of the concentration of the straight amylase powder. But given the additional positive effects of the malt, I'm thinking that this may be the better option of these two, but we won't know until we try. Now, I followed the same process for all three of these doughs because, well, they basically all told me to do the same thing. First, mix the dough, then let it rest for about 20 minutes. Then knead the dough until smooth, cover it and let it double in size, which should take about one to two hours. Then divide and shape the rolls, let rise again, score, and then bake. And the baking process is where there are a few differences. For Brian's recipe, he throws the rolls into a 375 degree oven and bakes for 25 to 30 minutes. For Ethan's recipe, he also bakes at 375, but once he throws the rolls into the oven, he also adds a couple of ice cubes to a preheated pan to create steam in the oven, which in theory should help the crust of the rolls to stay soft for longer and therefore to allow them to expand and rise better, among a few other things which we'll talk about in more detail in the future. But after 20 minutes, his rolls were done. Then for Mike's recipe, he bakes at 450 degrees Fahrenheit and he uses the same steaming technique as Ethan, baking for about 18 to 20 minutes until the rolls are nicely browned. All right, so we've got our three rolls here. We've got Ethan's, Brian's, and then Mike's from Pro Home Cooks. 
All right, I think I need a little bit more help here. So I broke out some of my Amoroso and Karanji rolls that I had frozen. This one's the Amoroso, this one's a small Karanji roll, and this one is from the full size loaf. But of these three I've made, I think the best tasting one is Ethan's recipe. Probably because of that combination of the milk and the oil. It's just a super enriched bread. It's got that really nice sort of buttery soft texture to it, but it's not really the style I'm looking for for a Philly cheesesteak. And after all, he never said this was a Philly cheesesteak roll. It's just meant to be a generic hoagie roll. So there's no knock against him, but it's not exactly what I'm looking for for this challenge. Now Mike's recipe gets us a little bit closer. You can see it's got that darker, a little bit crisper crust to it. And I don't know if it's from the enzymes or the slightly higher baking temperature, but the seam where I scored it expanded super nicely. And so we got a really nice rise in the oven. But I do have one major problem with this recipe, and that is he didn't include oil. And so the roll turns out a little bit too chewy and rustic. Because I know based on the ingredients list from Amoroso Rolls and Karanji that they both do include oil in the recipe. So you're just never really gonna be able to recreate it if you don't include it. To me, it makes the roll a little bit more like a baguette than a sandwich roll. So that's where Brian's recipe comes in. As far as a cheesesteak roll, I think this is the best of the three. He includes oil, but then he used water as a liquid, so it's not too enriched. And he was the only one that actually mentioned adding sesame seeds on top, which I do think is a really nice addition. But with that said, this one still isn't perfect. The exterior is still a little bit too soft. You can see the crust doesn't have a lot of crispness to it, and it's just not quite light and fluffy enough. To me, that's sort of the defining characteristic of a good cheesesteak roll. It's just super light and fluffy, but it's still got that chew and that nice crispness on the exterior. All three of these rolls turned out a little bit denser than what I wanted, and I don't think they were underproofed. Honestly, they looked like they were on the verge of being overproofed. I think it more has to do with the recipe and the baking method. Looking at the softness of the Karanji roll compared to any of these three, it's just night and day. It's just amazing how they can achieve such a crisp crust and the interior is just like so fluffy and cloud-like. I don't even know, I don't know how they do it, but I'm determined to figure it out and I think I know where to start. All right, so these are the three recipes I've tried so far, but seeing that none of them has been exactly what I'm looking for, I think we need to take a new approach. And if my New York style pizza series has taught me anything, it's that rather than trying to work backwards from these sort of home cooking recipes, I should start straight from the source. And seeing that I do have the ingredients list for both of the rolls that I'm trying to replicate, I might as well use it. Now these Amorosa rolls have a ton of ingredients, seeing that they're sort of a more commercial product. But if we kind of ignore all of that fluff, both of these recipes pretty much boil down to the same six basic elements. We've got flour, water, yeast, salt, malt, and some sort of fat. In Karanji's case, they use margarine, but in the Amoroso rolls, they just use a neutral oil. So for my recipes, that's where I'm gonna start. And I'm actually gonna develop four different recipes here. Now, as always, I'm gonna do this in baker's percentages, which just to quickly explain, basically means the flour is always written as 100%, and then every other ingredient is expressed as a percentage of the flour. So for example, with Brian's recipe, he uses 64 grams of water, water per 100 grams of flour, which means it's a 64% hydration. Similarly, he uses 2.6 grams of salt per 100 grams of flour, which means that the baker's percentage for salt is 2.6%. And the same applies for every other ingredient. Now, there are a few things that I'm gonna keep consistent between all four of my recipes. The first is the water content. I'm gonna go with the hydration of 64%, just like what Brian used in his recipe. The reason being that if we want the lightest and fluffiest rolls possible, we probably wanna push the hydration as high as we can. And I don't think we can really push it that much higher without making the dough too hard to handle. With that said, I am gonna test all of these factors at some point, but for this initial recipe, I'm not gonna mess with the hydration quite yet. Now, I'm not gonna include milk in the recipe because we already know that that's not included in any of our authentic recipes. For yeast, I'm gonna keep it at 1%, just because it's a pretty good baseline to go off of. We can adjust that if we wanna speed up or slow down the fermentation, but for now, 1% is a pretty good benchmark. Now, the salt is where things get a little bit interesting because the one thing that struck me with the Karanji rolls was that they actually had a very mild flavor, much milder than any of these home cook recipes. I tried. And upon further research, I found this video by Chain Baker on YouTube that actually reminded me that salt tightens the gluten network of a dough. And so the more salt you use, the less sort of light and spongy it's gonna be. Now, obviously we don't wanna go too low because then your dough is gonna have no flavor. But for me, I'm gonna try going all the way down to 1.8% because I think that'll help us to achieve a little bit lighter result. I can always adjust it up later if I find that it's too mild. But I think with a Philly cheesesteak, you don't need a lot of salt in the bread because there's already so much salt between the meat and the cheese. The roll, while it's very important, it's almost more of a textural thing than a flavor thing. And so you don't want it to dominate over the other ingredients. But now let's talk sugar. And the interesting thing is that Karanji actually doesn't use any sugar at all. And so for me, I think that's where I'm gonna start too. For my baseline recipe, I'll go with 0%. But Amoroso does include a little bit of sugar in their recipe, and so I still wanna try it. So for my recipe number three here, this is gonna be my high sugar recipe. And I'm gonna go with the baker's percentage of 10% sugar here. The reason I'm going so high is because I just wanna see what effect it's gonna have on the dough 
dough, and then I can always adjust the amounts from there. But that's the only recipe here that I'm gonna put sugar in. Now for oil, both of my authentic recipes use a neutral tasting oil, whereas my home cooking recipes used extra virgin olive oil. For me though, I see no reason to even mess with that. I'm just gonna go straight to the neutral oil. As far as percentage, I'm gonna start with a relatively low percent, just about 3%. But like with my sugar, I'm gonna do one version with an extra high amount of oil. So that's gonna be my recipe number two, and I'm gonna go with 10% oil. But now let's talk malt. So I'm assuming when my authentic recipes here are talking about malt, they're gonna be using something along the lines of this diastatic malt powder, which we used in Ethan's recipe from earlier. And as we already talked about, it helps to brown the crust a little bit better, but it also contains some of that amylase enzyme like what Mike from Pro Home Cooks used in his recipe. So for me, I see no reason to use the amylase enzyme on its own. Instead, I'm just gonna go with diastatic malt powder in all of my recipes. Based on my research, you don't need a large amount. I'm just gonna go with 0.5% as a baseline. But again, I'm gonna do one recipe with an extra high amount just to see its effect. So that's gonna be recipe number four, and I'm gonna go with a baker's percentage of 2%. So again, none of this is final. I still need to do a lot more testing, but the goal here is really just to isolate each of those three elements, the sugar, the oil, and the malt powder, to see if any of them are gonna get me closer to the result that I'm looking for. So let's bake some rolls. Now these are some cheesesteak rolls. Check that out. I mean, you can't feel this, but these are so much lighter than the other ones. Now, I think a lot of that is probably due to the ingredients that we use, but I also did one other thing differently. And that is, rather than doing the bulk fermentation and then dividing and immediately shaping into my rolls, I did a second rise after that initial shape. So I let it double, divided, let it double again, and then shaped into my rolls and let them rise for just about 15 to 20 minutes before baking. And that was because of another thing I saw on the Chain Baker YouTube channel, which is that the more times you DS your dough, reshape it and let it rise again, the more tender the crust is gonna end up. All right, so first impressions here though, obviously the first thing you're gonna notice is the browning. The sugar one browned by far quicker than the others, and actually I hadn't even looked at the bottom at first, but you can see it definitely got a little burnt. The diastatic malt powder I think actually had the best browning of all of these. I also think I'm getting pretty close to that super thin crispy crust here. On all of these you can hear a pretty decent crisp, and it's not a thick crust at all. I mean, this is pretty close to what I'm aiming for, and I've been experimenting with the baking method a little bit too achieve this, which we'll talk about in a future episode. But the big question here is the tenderness. It's so actually the most tender seems to be the diastatic malt powder yet again, probably because it rose the most out of all these. You can see the sugar one actually rose the least, which is kind of what I expected. It seems like in my experience, whenever I put sugar in a bread, it ends up a little bit more dense. The only reason to maybe include sugar would be for flavor. So we'll take a look at that in a minute. Now the baseline and the high oil don't seem too bad either. If anything, the high oil is a little bit more tender, but let's bite into them and see how they taste. Mm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that one's, it's sweet. There is a clear winner here, and I think you probably already know, but it's the diastatic malt powder. I mean, this gives me that distinctive flavor that I tasted from those karanji rolls. It was the lightest and airiest, it was the softest, best caramelization. Really, I think I just need to dial in that crust and we're pretty much there. One other gripe with this one, the crumb is probably a little bit more open than I would want. You can see there's some slightly bigger holes in here, whereas we want kind of a more uniform tight crumb without sacrificing that airiness, which isn't gonna be easy to do, but I I think we've done most of the hard work here, so I'm sure we can figure it out. In the meantime, you can check out the next episode of this series once it's uploaded right here. And if you haven't seen the first episode where I visited Philadelphia and tried some of the best cheesesteaks in the city, you can check that out right here. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll talk to you in the next one.